Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, I have everyone on mute, but you can unmute yourself um, uh, if you are one of our speakers. Um, for everybody else, we're going to have questions and answer time. Uh, but just to keep things moving along, we'd like you to put your questions into the chat box and we will facilitate that way. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Julia Pulver and I am running for state representative in the 39th district, uh, which is West Bloomfield, uh, Commerce, Wixom, and uh, Wolverine Lake. Um, 
and we are all entering this very different world of uh, campaigning and reaching out and talking about the things that are important to us. Um, so thank you for coming along with us on this and um, getting together to talk about um, the state of our education and, and kind of where we go from here. And maybe we have more questions than we have answers tonight and that's okay. Um, because we're going to get through this together. I have some really incredible uh, friends who joined me here tonight to talk and share their expertise with us. Um, I am not a teacher. I do have children in the West Bloomfield Public Schools. Um, so my perspective on our state of education just comes from, you know, my experience as a parent. Um, and so I really wanted to make sure we had some great education professionals joining us tonight to talk about, um, you know, what's going on and to answer our questions or at least kind of share some of their, their best practices with us. So um, I'm very excited to be joined uh, by three amazing uh, teacher professionals. Um, uh, we'll say Matt and the Denises, as I've been calling them today, we have. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction and then I'm going to let the professionals uh, give us an update on, on talk about what they've been hearing and seeing. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, so please, as we're going along, type your question into the chat box and we will make sure we get it covered. Um, but we're going to save that for after they're done talking because maybe they will cover um, you know, your question as we go through. So please feel free to just type that into the chat box. So I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction for all of our uh, great panelists. The so first is Matt Colazar. Matt, you can wave to everybody. Uh, he is the state representative for the 20th House District, which includes Northville, Plymouth, and parts of Canton. He is a member of the House Education and Policy Committees. Uh, Matt was a teacher at airport community schools for 12 and a half years prior to becoming a state legislator. Um, and he was president of his local MEA chapter. He has a bachelor's in secondary education, English and social studies, and a master's in English studies. So welcome, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we have Denise Dunn with us as well. Denise is a small business owner and financial advisor at Dunn Financial Services in a Corporation in West Bloomfield. Uh, she's a wife and mother of three. She has a daughter in college, a freshman daughter in high school, and a son who has an IEP in middle school. She is a trustee on the Wald Lake Consolidated School District Board of Education. She sits on the policy committee as well as the superintendent evaluation committee and is an executive member of the Wald Lake Special Needs Parent Advisory Committee. Uh, in her free time, she represents Gigi's Playhouse Detroit, a Down Syndrome Achievement Center, um, and their Outreach Committee. So welcome, Denise Dunn. Waving. Hi, everybody. And then we also have, <laughs> um, we also have with us Denise Forrest, um, who has spent her entire professional career with the Huron Valley Schools. Uh, she began her career over 30 years ago as a volunteer teaching art history lessons um, to K through five classes. During that time, she also taught classes through the Huron Valley Schools, uh, working in the, uh, with the community's cognitive impaired adults um, for about eight years. Uh, this led to a position with the Huron Valley Schools as a paraeducator. Uh, and then once she completed her teaching certificate, she was hired as an elementary art teacher. And this led her on a path for 20 years. Uh, her passion was working with teachers, and that led to a uh, position as an association president. Uh, she became quickly involved in union activity on the Huron Valley Education Association uh, uh, Representative Council, um, and really knew that she had to advocate for her prof profession. Uh, she spent 11 years on the association's bargaining team. And that led to her for an interest in running for the HVEA executive uh, board. Um, she also uh, decided that uh, her call to public service um, would lead her to run for a seat on the Huron Valley School uh, Board, which she won. And she is currently running for state rep in the 44th district. So welcome to Denise Forrest. So Denise Forrest. <laughs> 
I'll start with you. If you want to give um, maybe a little bit of a, an update on, you know, how things are going in Huron Valley, um, sure. what you're hearing, what concerns you're hearing about most, um, we'll hear from you. And then Denise and Matt as well. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, I feel like I'm good, in good hands here. Thanks, Julia, for inviting me. Uh, I, I am currently uh, the secretary on the school board, and um, it's nice having another Denise with me because I do have another Denise on our school board, so it's a world full of Denises. Um, I am on the uh, also on the Teaching, Learning, and Technology subcommittee as well as the Finance Committee and the Huron Valley School Board. Um, so, as Julia said, there's been um, a life's worth of changes in uh, just under three weeks uh, for teaching and learning uh, across the state of Michigan and across the country. Um, and I'd like to thank first everyone involved, all the stakeholders, all the educators, bus drivers, uh, food service, paraprofessionals, custodians that have um, been working on the front lines of education to take care of our kids, especially um, those involved in curriculum, teachers and administrators, and developing a plan uh, to deliver uh, instruction. Um, About education. Yeah, uh, uh, instruction. Uh, so after Governor Whitner call, called off uh, school for the state on Thursday night around 11 o'clock, our superintendent immediately um, decided that we would not, that uh, teachers, students, staff would not be attending school on that Friday. So the plan was on Monday for, for all parties involved to go into the school and, and for parents to get their belongings, medicine for their children, uh, any of their papers, books, coats, and teachers were working together to um, work on PLCs, professional learning communities. So they grabbed their materials for that so that when they got home uh, and on their computers, they've been on their computers ever since, they started developing um, plans for the first week to uh, teach kids. So they got in groups, for example, um, you know, high school, social studies, math, and science were together remotely. Elementary school, perhaps, that the first grade team at one elementary school would get together, or the first grade team at all uh, eight of our elementary schools would get together and develop lessons. So there's kind of a three, um, uh, three phases of that, the first uh, week and then the second week and the third phase, which is really happening, um, it's spring break now, but the third phase will be happening, you know, um, uh, the week before spring break, spring break, and when we get back to uh, continue to develop plans uh, for their students and, you know, not, not everybody has access uh, to technology. I think that uh, across this state and across the country, we're beginning to understand um, to understand that there's a lot of differences in, in where kids are coming from and how we can teach them. You know, that's that's true in healthcare and that's true in education. <clears throat> so, um, going forward, um, we're going to uh, get Chromebooks for students that don't have any. Um, any computers or internet or technology and they will be able, our students will be able to check out Chromebooks and use them. And I believe that Comcast is, um, is giving uh, folks they can't afford to internet. So a Chromebook or a computer is not, is no good <laughs> without internet access. And so that's a big problem for some kids. So. Uh, we also have a meal plan that we uh, got together really, really quickly. Uh, kudos again to our bus drivers who are busing uh, breakfast and lunches to, I don't know, around six locations, um, including Milford High School and Lakeland High School. Our district is 105 square miles. So that's a, a large, you know, that's a large distance to for a people to drive, parents to drive, they don't have cars or they have jobs. So we, we go to different sites and then they can come and pick up their food. And so I believe we've had oh, nine, almost, almost 20,000 meals picked up 
from our families uh, in the almost three weeks that this uh, this thing's been going on. And so at those locations, we'll have some Chromebooks for uh, students. They can check them out and, and use them. Going forward, I don't know, Matt might have a little more insight than um, the rest of us uh, being uh, in the House of Representatives of what might be coming. So, you know, again, kudos to our to our teachers. You know, nobody wants to be nobody wants to have to work like this. So it's it's really inspiring to know that in here on Valley, and I'm sure Wad Lake is no different that you know, our, our, our staff is working diligently to take care of our kids. It's, it's pretty inspiring to see how quickly a group can mobilize. You know, we have Absolutely. almost yeah, 9,000 students and I said 105 square miles, people working remotely. Um, I know now why I picked the vocation of being an art teacher, so I didn't have to deal with computers all the time. So, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's tough for people uh, when they're not necessarily tuned into this this type of uh, information. So it's a skill set we all have to develop. So in a nutshell, that's where we are right now. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for for giving us that update. Um, and I do want to just give a huge shout out to everybody who I mean, I you know how do you turn an entire system around with a day's notice? You know, this just. The fact that we had so much success um, in, in being able to make that transition as quickly as we did, um, as everybody did, is just really inspiring. Um, Matt, did you want to give a little bit of an update um, on what's going on right now in Lansing? I'm sure I would be uh, happy to. And also, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that uh, while I've lived in Plymouth now for going on a decade, I am a, pro a proud uh, Wald Lake Western graduate. So I have to throw that out there. Uh, so I know the area here very well. Um, right now, we are anticipating the governor to um, announce an executive order. It sounds like it's going to be Thursday. Um, there was a bridge article that came out yesterday about it. Um, and also, I know it was reported in the news. Originally, they were saying Tuesday, Wednesday. Now they're saying Thursday. And she's going to talk about what is going to happen with the remainder of this year um, and what they're going to be doing with schools. Um, I can tell you that I know that the governor has been adamant. And uh, I share this belief that there is no true substitute for a teacher and a student in the classroom. There is no substitute that, that can um, ever beat that. But that being said, we are on unprecedented times and there is going to be the need for students to still um, have some type of consistency and continuity of school. So it'll be interesting to see what she has to say. Uh, again, we're anticipating that to be on Thursday now. Um, I do know that she is very sensitive, as many of us are, to um, schools still receiving their state aid payments and making sure that we can keep employees paid because just because school's not going on doesn't mean that, that there's not a lot of really good work going on. I've seen so many social media posts of teachers that are um, still delivering online instruction as best they can, doing enrichment activities. Um, you're hearing about schools getting food to all the kids um, who otherwise, without school, they're, they're not getting possibly breakfast or lunch and they're still getting those meals. Um, we wanna make sure that those services still go on for all of our students here in Michigan. And I know that is the big um, thing going on right now. As far as the legislature goes, um, we have not met since Wednesday of last week. Um, yep, Wednesday of last week, sorry, all the days are kind of blending together now these days. Um, and uh, I can tell you that um, I don't know when we will meet exactly next. Um, for those who don't know, we did lose uh, one of our members um, just the other day, uh, Representative Isaac Robinson passed away. Um, the family suspects it was coronavirus. Um, we also had another member of the House, Tyrone Carter, who contracted coronavirus. I'm happy to report that he is on the mend. Um, but still, this is, this is something to take very seriously. And we have to discuss if we do need to meet and pass legislation, what that looks like and how we do that in a responsible manner, not to, just, not to endanger ourselves as well as the staff that works in Lansing. So um, that's just a quick rundown of what's going on and I'll be happy to um, answer questions as we go along. Thank you, Matt, so much. And um, yeah, I want, you know, I was crushed uh, as we all were to hear about um, Isaac's passing and 
it just, you're absolutely right. You know, everything we know about how to do, conduct any sort of normal business in any way has been upended and really, you know, put a, a huge, uh, you know, put everybody at risk. And, and if we try to carry on the way that we have, so as, as daunting as some of these things are, we have very little choice, but to just figure it out and, and not stick to the way the the rigid way things have been done. Um, so my, my deepest sympathies and condolences to you and everybody um, who is affected by this. Um, you know, this is, this hurts. <laughs> this definitely hurts. And, um, but we, we have to continue on. So I want to bring up uh, Denise Dunn now um, to give us a, a, a update from uh, Wald Lake and what's going on and uh, some of the issues or concerns that you're I muted myself too quickly. <laughs> You're hearing Denise. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, kind of piggyback and say thank you. All of our teachers and educators are working very, very hard in Wald Lake. Um, they're putting a lot of great things in place for our students, but um, so everyone's working tirelessly, and, and I have a lot of gratitude. Just I'm not a teacher. I've never been a teacher, but I now am homeschooling, um, and our teachers are providing amazing resources for parents. Um, so I'm very, very grateful um, for everything that they're doing. Um, but we in Wild Lake um, right away saw that we would have a need. Um, we have a very diverse population here in Wild Lake and we, I, I, we knew that we would have a need for students to have that access to Chromebooks. So we right away kind of got mobilized on that in our three high schools. At the three high schools, we provided um, 1,100 Chromebooks to our families right off the bat. So um, the internet access, um, like Denise said, will be provided. Um, Comcast is giving some free internet and then Spectrum is another source that people have um, cited for some free internet, at least for two months, I think, and then needs-based after that. Um, but I have been getting a lot of questions about some of our most vulnerable population as far as how do um, we close the gap or keep the gap narrowing for our kids with special needs or IEPs. And um, in Wald Lake, um, our teachers have been doing a really great job on Google Classroom. So um, we have gen ed teachers who have their own Google Classroom set up, but we also have uh, resource room teachers and special ed teachers and our OTs, our, our um, psychiatrists, our social workers who have also set up Google Classroom um, to really kind of keep in touch with all of those students who need extra support. Um, so everyone's really working together um, to make sure that the needs are met of all of our students. Um, so for example, my son has an IEP and he has some gen ed classes, but he also needs resource help for math and reading. His resource room teacher connects with those gen ed teachers to get him um, the um, direction that he needs in the gen ed classes so that he can have the same curriculum that all of the other students get but at his level of learning. Um, so she checks in every single day uh, with a video as do all of the gen ed teachers. Um, they really kind of narrow down that um, content for the day or the week. And then they check back with each student to make sure that they are understanding the content and understanding what needs to be learned, whether it's for that day or for the week, his teacher does it every day. Um, we also have our um, school psychologist reaching out and doing um, wellness checks because that's needed. You know, our academic, um, our academics is a priority, but also our, our social and emotional well-being um, for our kids is very important. So just to have those wellness checks um, and, and making sure that kids who are already in crisis or having a hard time are being checked in on um, and then that there are social emotional needs, you know, being confined to your home with your siblings, with your parents, um, it kind of, you know, weighs on everyone. So just making sure that academically they're cared for and emotionally that they're being cared for um, is very important. So just all across the board, our teachers are making sure that lessons are still getting to the, the students, um, whether it's online or um, a lot of teachers went above and beyond and did paper pencil packets and did weekly packets that they passed out when we found out schools were closing. Um, so just really having 
um, something for all of the students and making sure everyone's needs are met. And that's what we're doing here in Walt Day. That sounds great. Um, and you know, again, it's it's just amazing with such short notice what everybody was able to sort of crank out almost like, you know, we were, uh, you've been training and planning for this, you know, for, for uh, decades and, and we know that wasn't the case. Usually, I mean, there's some contingency planning, but usually not to this extent. Oh, um, my second grader um, has made me a very purple drawing. Um, and she says, just because we can't go out doesn't mean we can't have fun. Do a dance party. Do a dance party. So that's part of what we're doing to have fun. So um, getting back to uh, some of the questions. And again, if anyone has a question, please uh, type it in the chat box and we'll make sure it gets answered. Um, there's a, a couple of questions about paraprofessionals um, and if they are going to be able to continue to uh, be paid during um, the school closures. Um, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, that, that I know, um, we are very sensitive to that in the legislature. I can say, at least I can speak for my side of the aisle on that one. That's something we want to see continue. Um, I know in conversations I've had with the governor's team, they are also very responsive to that and very um, sensitive to that. And that's why they want to make sure that uh, schools are still getting their state aid payments. And that's why that is very important because with those state aid payments, we can still continue to pay our para pros as well as um, a variety of other occupations that inhabit a school. You know, it's more than just uh, teachers and administrators. We know there's para pros, there's custodial staff, there's bus drivers, um, you know, there's counselors, there's psychologists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we know that we need to make sure that these people are, who really just do so much for our communities are still um, taken care of. So that's something I'm sensitive to, um, especially being a teacher, being somebody who, I'll tell you what, I could easily look back on my career and talk, think about para pros that were just lifesavers, especially early in my career when uh, um, I was just a, a newbie teacher. It, it definitely, uh, there were some para pros that saved my life on a number of occasions um, in the classroom, and uh, I, I really think we owe it to them. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident and hoping so that that's the way this shakes out, but I do know for a fact that the governor and her team are very sensitive. And I, I'm glad to hear that. I think, um, and Matt, maybe you can talk a little bit more to this or Denise or Denise. Um, a lot of the um, school budgets were already sort of put in place before this happened, correct? So this, yeah. a lot of this is not fairly so, impact was already established. Right, and I, you know, I would say that that's very true in being, um, a retired union president, we're always looking for uh, out for all our employees, including hourly employees, which paraprofessionals uh, are in that category, along with um, uh, food service custodial bus drivers. And um, it's my hope too, that we preserve these jobs. We do have it in our school budget. We have it in the state budget. I understand also um, uh, payroll is being met uh, in terms of pensions. Um, you know, it, it'll get it'll get tricky, and you know, this is no no educator likes the unknown. They're called lesson plans for a reason, and and we kind of don't don't have you know a plan going forward quite yet, so it's difficult. But you know, if we have to, to make up work in the summer, that's when something might get a little trickier as far as uh, the finances go. Um, it's my hope that everyone gets paid, you know, for their hourly work, regardless if they're in a physical school or not. But again, we need to have um, our legislature, Matt and his uh, and his colleagues, and um, the Department of Education, MDE and maybe the Federal Department of Education weigh in on this and our governor. So it's gonna take all, all of those folks to make a recommendation. And you know, at this point, maybe on Thursday, we'll know a little bit more when the governor speaks again. So, I mean, that's where we're at. So kind of piggybacking off of that, um, when it comes to the question of 
is it better to forgive days or to make them up when we're looking at potentially missing months of instruction versus weeks? Um, you know, obviously we know that there will be a lot of logistical issues, but just from an education standpoint, um, you know, it, is it possible to, to make it up or is it better to sort of, you know, forgive the days and have everyone move on? Well, that's, uh, again, that's, an, that's kind of an un, unknown. I think there's probably a percentage of folks that, that want to go during the summer and teach, and then there's others that say, let's forgive the days and start fresh next year. If we start fresh next year, then, of course, it's still not going to be business as, un, as usual as far as instruction goes. So I hope, um, you know, if that's the scenario, then there's going to be a lot of work being done over the, over the summer by educators to plan for the school year and for that loss of instruction time. And on the flip side, you know, parents probably want to know what's going on. Do they have to make, they make arrangements? Um, you know, if this, um, if the virus evens out and we're even allowed to go out and about during the summer, parents have to make uh, arrangements too financially and you know for their work and for their childcare. I think uh, another thing to think about with this too is, I mean, we'll see what the governor's executive order has to say on Thursday, but um, I'd imagine you could also look at a possible combination of the two um, as well. I wouldn't be shocked if we saw something like that. Um, I think it's also important to point out that, you know, you don't want to necessarily risk kids going back to school in late June, July, because there's a lot of school districts in the state that simply do not have air conditioning. And you could be creating a very unsafe work, working and learning environment. So that's something to consider as well. Um, I do think I agree with Denise wholeheartedly that when it comes back to the fall, it's not going to be business as usual for our teachers. They're going to have a lot of work to do. Um, but I will say this. Uh, um, as somebody who's spent a lot of time in the classroom, there's no doubt in my mind they'll rise to the occasion. They always do. So uh, I think that's something to definitely keep in mind is that when our kids go back and, and knock on wood, hopefully life goes back to normal, um, they'll have some catching up to do. But I have no doubt that our teachers and our students will get the job done. Um, so there's another question about um, kind of on that same vein as well, is there any discussion about removing the pressure of standardized testing next year as well so teachers can focus on finding out where each child is in their learning and move them forward without the continued pressure of the standardized testing since we're all going to be playing catch up kind of no matter what the scenario is? I think right now um, the conversation has been we got to figure out how to get through this year. And once we accomplish that, then we can start to look at next. I haven't heard those conversations, um, but I think a lot of them are going to be had headed into the fall. Um, I think right now it's about getting through this crisis. I mean, these are unprecedented times. I said this yesterday in a social media post. Uh, it's unprecedented times is going to require um, unprecedented action, and that's where we're at right now. So kind of switching gears a little bit, um, from a parent's perspective, you know, I'm trying to sort of explain things I don't fully understand either to my kids. And I guess, you know, what, what can we, how can we help our kids understand what's going on and why their education has changed so much? And then on the other side of that, how do we keep them motivated if it kind of seems like school's out, you know? Kind of the there's there's sort of some some days it's like I really wish I were back in school and other days it's like eh why bother so I guess do it does anybody have uh, Denise Denise or Matt you know sort of how do we keep our kids motivated when everything is different and they kind of don't get that um, immediate you know I gave the right answer the teacher said yes and I turned this thing in as I normally do and I know that that's how education is supposed to work? How do we kind of keep that motivation going? Um, so with my kids, I kind of have, um, I, so I have one daughter who's a freshman in high school and she, um, things come a little bit easier to her. So she will get the work done that's assigned really quickly and then kind of move on to other things throughout the day. And my son, 
um, needs a lot of extra help and a lot more hand holding. Um, so we kind of chunk up the day and we take his learning in, in sections. So we'll do like morning learning um, and then he'll take breaks um, and then we'll do some afternoon learning and, and so on. Um, but what I find is um, just being really honest and asking a lot of questions and to make sure that they're understanding what's happening. They're getting a lot of information on social media and on the internet. They're seeing the news in the background. Um, so just making sure that I'm asking them a lot of questions about it and making sure that they um, are communicating to me if they're fearful or have anxiety about whether it's schoolwork or getting things turned in on time. I know my daughter was making sure things were being turned in on time and looking at her grades. We're doing less looking at the grades and more focusing on um, you know, the content of the work and what they're turning in and, and making sure that their expectations are um, being met and that the teachers are, um, you know, they're turning in what the teachers are asking for. Um, but I, I did notice that, um, you know, as much as you don't want to pass on some of the fear and anxiety, it just happens naturally. So I did catch my um, little guy online asking Surrey how many coronavirus cases are in Michigan or in New York, um, you know, things he's hearing around him. So you just have to be mindful of that and make sure that we're, um, you know, not passing up that on to them. That anxiety part is true. I think a lot of kids feel anxiety uh, coming down from their, uh, from their parents quite a bit. And I know my uh, friends with really young kids, I mean, they understand, you know, that there's some bad germs out there and we have to stay home and be protected from the germs. That's why school is looking uh, different. And, um, uh, you know, I have a, a friend um, who's an only child. Uh, I'm a friend with a, a son who's an only child and he's in middle school and he did not understand you know, when this first started, why mom wouldn't let him play with his other friends in the neighborhood. And some of the other friends were, were okay to play together, but, you know, he said, you know, why do I have to stay home? And it's hard to explain things like that. And now it's, it's pretty clear that no, don't go, don't play on a playground, you know, don't play basketball outside in a hoop, you know, hoops and, you know, it's, it's baseball season, um, don't play catch. And so I think eventually the kids kind of, <coughs> excuse me, catch up um, with some of the understanding. As far as keeping them motivated, um, you know, schedules are important for kids. And I think a lot of parents out there uh, homeschooling their kids, put them on a schedule. I ran into uh, a former uh, parent who uh, he and his wife, I uh, taught some of their kids, I know they have five or six kids, and uh, there's a lot at home and he's like, they're outside, you know, uh, working around the house too. And so there's nothing wrong with that type of activity either to kind of, um, to kind of pitch in. Um, and, you know, maybe, I don't know if kids are already doing this, but getting online and doing some of the classwork with some of their friends and classmates, maybe that will help uh, keep them somewhat motivated. So, I mean, because I know it's hard staring at a computer all day, but uh, do some art projects. That's what I would do uh, to break up the day. And I know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my the music art teacher, <laughs> yeah, my music teacher friend, my, my colleague uh, from Country Oaks, I caught him doing um, some uh, singing and, and guitar playing with his students. And so there's, there's kind of tangible ways to do things, you know, even on a, a 2D computer screen. Um, I want to just chime in on this one as well. I don't have children. Um, one group I would like to, as somebody who taught seniors, um, this is a hard time for a lot of seniors. And I, th I think, it, I mean, you know, I've heard from a lot of parents in my district who their seniors are very upset, no prom, um, uncertain if and when there is going to be a commencement. And um, it sounds like most. Um, most people understand why and what's going on, but, uh, and that's something that, you know, once we get back to them, I'm sure on the local level, they're going to arrange commencements for their students. I'd be shocked if districts didn't do that. But um, at the same time, I think it's a time to really, I mean, if a senior is upset, it's understandable. And I, my heart really does go out to our seniors. That, that's, that's heartbreaking to, you know, 
see those uh, memories put into jeopardy. And I know a lot of them are very upset right now. It's very true. You know, we have a lot of different sort of rites of passage that are connected with our education. Um, you know, yeah, prom, high school graduation, you know, even though I, my, my fifth grader was really looking forward to his, you know, fifth grade graduation and, and they, their ceremony. And then they used to all, you know, they go to camp um, that he's been, he's watched his two older sisters go to camp and it was finally his year to go to, to camp with the, uh, you know, with his fifth grade class. And he's devastated that they're not going to be able to go. But, you know, so there really are a lot of different sort of, um, yeah, uh, milestones that are, are not going to get hit this year um, in, in the same way. But I agree, Matt, I, I'm hard, I'm, I'm, I would be shocked if, if we didn't find other, you know, creative ways to, to mark those rites of passage. It might just look a little different um, and, and than what we normally are, are used to. Um, I have a question as a parent, um, and I know there's no great, uh, you know, rules or anything. We're all kind of making this up as we go, but a lot of us now are working like we were full time and trying to now, you know, teach our kids as well. Um, try and even with the e-learning and the cloud learning that we're doing in West Bloomfield, um, you know, some kids are very self-directed and they can get through their list of assignments and they're done. Uh, some kids, especially my, my younger two, you know, really need someone to sit next to them and walk them through everything. Um, you know, I guess what, how can parents or, you know, what is there, are there any good best practices that we're finding of ways for parents to balance their work and their, their new, you know, work life and teaching life um, when it comes to the kids that really need more of that side-by-side -side, um, attention. Mm, that's a tough one right there because um, that's why we have school and teachers. They do that work. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, um, you know, if both parents work, maybe there's a, you know, time where one parent might have an aptitude as an aptitude or music or PE or art. So kind of maybe rely on the strengths that each parent has or even remotely, you know, for example, uh, I, got, I got the art gene, my brother has the math gene, you know, have someone else, a, a friend or a family member who might be able to tutor your child also with some of the lessons would be helpful, you know, virtually like that. But, you know, it's, um, you know, there's no substitute, I think we're finding out for having teachers, paraprofessionals, staff in a building taking care of our kids and meeting their uh, instructional needs and emotional needs. Um, you know, let's just hope that we can get back to the business of education sooner rather than later. Oh, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I'd like to believe I was always a very big appreciator and advocate for teachers, but uh, now, you know, I, I don't even know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I could ever express my gratitude for the fact that I had, you know, uh, I, I can't even tell you how many dozens since I have two daughters in middle school, all of their teachers, and then the elementary school teachers. I think this year I sat down and counted, there were 14 different teachers that were teaching Pulver kids <laughs> in some way or another. Uh, and God, do I miss them right now. So um, yeah, that's, you know, I, like I said, there's no great answer to this, but that's a really great point of you know, we're all sort of crowdsourcing answers. So maybe finding, you know, people in your life who do have more of an aptitude for science or math or art or music. Um, I'm clueless in trying to help my sixth grader learn trumpet. I can't help, you know, so maybe we can start looking for, you know, if anybody can, uh, if you have somebody in your life who maybe is musically inclined, they could maybe help too. Um, I just wanted to chime in real quick. My um, high school daughter loves music and she was in theater and unfortunately their play got canceled um, right before, it, it was a week before I think is when school got canceled. 
but she has been, um, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that teach you how to play musical instruments. Um, so she's been doing that. And then just in between working with my son, um, she'll take him and um, play ukulele with him and they sing. Um, and the art teacher or the gym teacher even, um, he was on, he has his own Google Classroom and he checks in every day and has a workout for the kids to do every day. Um, art teacher has some art projects. The PTSA has um, an art competition, I want to say, with an Amazon gift card for a prize every week. Um, so just really motivating them to do other things. My husband's teaching the kids how to cook. I'm helping them learn what a budget is. Um, so just kind of thinking outside the box and keeping them interested in, in different things is good. Um, so there's some discussion in the chat about maybe this possibly having the opposite effect of us being more appreciative of teachers, that it may, uh, to, to those who maybe were already not inclined to respect teaching or anybody in, you know, paraprofessionals, um, across um, the entire continuum of education, that it may show that they were um, not needed, not essential, that they are, are, I think the phrasing here is dispensable and could be replaced by for-profit online learning modules um, or models. Um, could you speak to that? I mean, I think, I know obviously where, where I stand, I think where everybody else stands, um, that we're, we're all, making do because we have to, but this, this is in no way, um, you know, an adequate substitute for uh, qualified educators in, in the room doing what um, they are educated um, and trained to do. Um, I can absolutely speak to this one. I don't know how much time we have. Um, also, sorry, my cat is going up against the back of the laptop now. Goodbye. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I've got, I could go on this one for a while. First of all, let me say, and it goes back to what I said at the beginning of this, there is no substitute to a teacher in the classroom with a student. And I am of that belief, and I know many of my colleagues are as well. While there may be some who, are, who don't believe that, I certainly do. Um, when I ran for, for this office back in 2018, um, that was what I ran on, was I basically call it the anti-Betsy DeVos agenda. And I stick to that to this day. As somebody who's been in the classroom, loves the classroom, I always say, I didn't leave public education, I'm fighting for it. And uh, I really get upset when people say, well, this could, be, uh, this could easily be a uh, replacement for teachers. No, it can't. Because are we talking about students learning, or are we just talking about completing courses? Because there's a big difference there. If you're just talking about completing courses, maybe online learning is effective, but when it comes to a student truly learning, I still believe the best place for them to be is in that classroom with their peers, with the teacher. Hands down, best way they can learn. Preach. Denise? Yeah, Matt, I couldn't have said it any better. I just want to add, um, I I have always appreciated the hard work that the teachers have done throughout the years with my kids, um, even more so that I'm at home trying to do this job. It's just something that my kids, um, so my son went from, you know, going to school every single day and being tutored two nights a week um, to me just trying to pull it together enough to make sure that he gets bare minimum um, when teachers are going above and beyond providing a ton of resources um, it's just a job that not everyone can do. He could never learn um, strictly from the internet. He's Zooming with his classmates, he's Zooming with his teachers. He's still not getting the same quality education that he would get face-to-face -face with his teachers. It's so much more than um, you know, a couple of worksheets and, and a Zoom video. They, they get so much more in the classroom every single day. So it's not even, it's not even comparable. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a, you know, all, all students are, are unique. You know, there are some students who are, are very self-directed, who may be able to, you know, yeah, like Matt said, complete courses, um, but, but there really isn't um, any, any substitute for, for not just having the information, but the experience as well. You know, we're talking about being socially isolated, how much that is uh, impacting not just us, but our kids and their anxiety levels, their depression levels. 
Um, and, you know, it's not just the content, you know, schools offer a home outside of the home uh, for, for kids and they're missing that home um, and they're missing their teachers um, as much as they might, you know, gripe and complain and, um, you know, sometimes not really want to go. Um, I've been a little surprised by the response I've gotten from my kids of how much they miss just getting on the bus and going and being in the building and, you know, seeing the, the teachers that they used to complain about, you know, that they, uh, what is it? Oh, they, they gave me more, you know, homework than they should have. And now they're, they, if they gave them one wish, it would be that they could go back to that. Um, so I've just been really surprised by that and realizing that it is so much more than just content. It is so much more than just the, the actual uh, learning. Um, so I, I want to um, kind of close. We got in about 15 minutes left or so. Uh, if anybody still has uh, questions that they really want answered, please put them in the chat box. We are gonna um, talk about some resources, um, but if I, I do wanna kind of uh, give a, a, a last thought for for parents, I'm going to pose this to the panel. It's a fill in the blank since a lot of this right now is falling onto the parents to to make sure that things are getting done, and and that's adding to a lot of our stress and anxiety. Um, so I would say fill in the blank. If parents do nothing else during this time, just make sure to blank. So if we do nothing else for our kids, make sure that we what. I can go. Um, I, I think make sure um, make sure you're. I would say make sure they still understand that this is not a vacation and it is still very much a time to learn. And I know it's. I'm not blaming a kid at all if they think, oh my gosh, I don't have to go back to school. But this is an important time for them, and they, they're going to have an important fall as well. So I think just uh, I tell parents just to make sure. Students understand this is still a very important time for them to still keep that learning going in any way they can. While it may not be what they're used to in the classroom, it's still very important. And then I guess I would say for parents, um, you know, they have this time at home with their kids, both social, emotional aid to get to know them, but also in the educational vein to get their to get to know their kid and what their kid really. Uh, or kids, plural, really like and enjoy and use this time, think of it kind of as a journey. I mean, we have, if the glass is half full, we have this as a gift to spend more time with our family. And Denise mentioned that um, we don't have to worry so much uh, about taking a test, taking the standardized tests that have been waived, taking NWEA, or M-STEP tests that have been waived, but enjoy the journey with your kids and, and enjoy the learning experience with them together. Um, so I would just add to make sure to check on their emotional and, and mental well-being. Um, I know that a lot of kids are missing things. Like we said, the seniors are missing out on some big parts of their life like prom, um, basketball championships were canceled, hockey nationals were canceled, plays were canceled. These are things that are really, really important to our kids. Um, and, and I think, you know, some kids go quiet, some kids get emotional and cry. Um, but just to really kind of have those check-ins with them and make sure that you're talking to them and, and knowing that they are okay. And if they need to talk, um, that they have a safe place and, and people who are safe to, to talk to and, and kind of unload on if they need to. So there's a couple of questions and comments in the chat about um, the kids who, um, for, for whom school was sort of the safe place and who may not have safe um, home environments. Um, and, um, you know, how are we making sure, are we making sure that we're checking in on those kids? Um, you know, if there were the counselors and social workers uh, in the school who may not be able to talk to these kids directly anymore um, and have to go, you know, uh, are sort of separated. How are we or how are schools, um, you know, dealing with con pre-existing concerns about kids who may not have been in safe or, or stable or who are, who are in homes that 
may be a little bit more at risk now with the added stress and the, the lack of regular sort of check-in. Mm, I know I, I recently had a conversation uh, with our assistant superintendent of uh, teacher learning technology and how our, um, our, our staff, our social workers and psychologists, you know, they have caseloads, they know, you know, what their students need. I know that they are regularly checking in on, on their students and parents as well, but you know, the the emotional state of affairs right now are difficult at best for everybody. And, you know, I'd like to see, you know, what kind of work, how we're going to meet the needs of kids that may be um, having some difficulties, some emotional difficulties, you know, how we can better take care of them. I know there's websites out there, there's people to talk to and getting that information to our, to these families, but I'm, I know that our social workers and psychs are, you know, boots on the ground doing that work for us. Um, I do know in our district, um, starting last week, um, our social workers and our psychologists are doing um, the wellness checks over the phone, um, you know, trying to check in over the phone in person if they can, which you can't do right now, um, via email if they can't get a hold of them over the phone. Um, but it's, it's really a work in progress because there's only so much that can be done right now. So that's definitely a huge concern for all districts. Um, I know from the state level, um, what we see a lot of, and this is so much more of a local school district level um, as far as day to day on the front lines issue, but from the state level, it's up to us to continue to supply the funding to make sure we can still provide those services, whether they be mental health services, food services to schools. Um, I know in particular, one thing that I always remember from my days as a teacher is I got to a point in my career where um, I would not really celebrate a snow day anymore. And uh, it's because I knew that if we were not in school, that meant there are kids at school that were not getting breakfast, we're not getting lunch, and maybe they get dinner, who knows. And uh, that always kind of sat with me. So in, in these times, that's something that still sits with me to this day. And that's why it's been really heartwarming to see a lot of these school districts step up and get food to these kids. It's, it's really been something to see on social media. Absolutely. You know, I feel like when this first came down and everybody sort of, you know, said all of the things that they were worried about, um, it seemed like a lot of those initial concerns were handled really quickly. The first of which was, what about meals? What are, how are we going to do that? And I've, I've been very, very encouraged by seeing all of the school districts, um, you know, not just for their own students either. I know in West Bloomfield, they put it out there, you know, we're going to provide meals um, to anybody. You just pre-order them. You don't have to even be a member of the school district. Like there has been, um, you know, countless examples of that, of, of uh, districts really just working at lightning speed to make sure that these things um, happen, that a lot of these sort of, you know, uh, this, this holistic picture of what children need or what they get when they go to school is met as quickly as possible. Um, I'm going to do um, on one more question from the chat box here, and then I want to have our, our panelists um, kind of close out with maybe some of the um, resources that uh, parents can use. If you want to, you can type them into the chat box. Um, any helpful websites or resources, um, hotlines, anything that, that you would like people to know as a resource when they are talking about, um, you know, questions about their education. Um, and then we're going to, to wrap up right at eight o'clock and respect everyone's time. So last question from the chat box here um, is about um, leveling the playing field. Um, this may be something that the governor talks about um, when she um, ex uh, makes her executive order. Um, but the idea that, you know, some school districts may be, um, it says um, district to district, our district here in Valley chose to give kids pass fail for third semester. What if other districts are grading? How are we going to balance that for kids applying to college? So, you know, is, is there going to be a way possibly to, to sort of, um, make things equal between the districts when it comes to things like grading versus passing. 
I think that with, again, without being uh, in the office when the governor crafts her executive order, I, I think that this is going to, for seniors especially, because I think that this question of a pass fail when you're thinking about college and things like that um, is going to be something that's paid attention a lot to the seniors. And I think it's going to be a lot of local control. As far as um, our underclassmen and the younger ones, I think they're, they're still going to get a program to complete and how, again, how each individual school district um, does that varies, but I think you're going, you're going to see with some guidelines from the state, you're gonna see a, a lot of ability for uh, local school districts to kind of craft how they wanna do it because we do know that every school district is different. And I think that's where we're headed, but uh, it's a good question and it'll be interesting to see, but I do think in terms of seniors, I could see something like that. Every school district kind of knows where their seniors are and what they need to fulfill their graduation credits. And I think, uh, I think that's what we're going to be seeing with that. Real quick, I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, you know, that's an issue, uh, a here and there issue that I'm aware of. Um, you know, do we do we cut the semester off for uh, for middle schoolers and high schoolers? You know, um, March twelfth when school ended, or do we? You know, there's a few more weeks of learning that the kids had in their semester. Do you um, just give a pass fail or do you give, you know, grading up until that time because kids were do, doing really well? What about the kids that weren't doing really, really well? Would they benefit more from a pass fail grade? So there's, you know, there's, it's, it's a complicated issue and I, we're going to find out what's moreover what's going to happen with grade point averages for the end of the school year. How will that work? And I think that for some of that um, information, we're going to have to lean on our central office personnel to talk with other districts. I know our superintendent regularly has meetings um, with other Oakland County superintendents. I think maybe uh, Oakland ISD, maybe they'll weigh in on that subject, but you know, that that's a tough one to figure out. I do agree with Matt that it's gonna be somewhat of a local control. We have uh, over 800 districts uh, in Michigan, public schools and public school charters. So, um, you know, that's something certainly for parents to continue to monitor as I will too, as a school board member. Denise, did you want Denise Dunn? Did you want to weigh in? Um, I, you know what, I was just posting some links of um, some resources, and um, I am just kind of piggyback on what they said. I, I agree with what they said. It's just a work in progress at this point. Well, I just want to thank. I'm going to kind of wrap things up for tonight. Um, we are going to share this recording, so if somebody wasn't able to. Um, watch it and uh, you really would like to share this content, we're going to make it available um, as well as the links that are provided. Um, I would say, you know, just keep your chin up. We are all in this together. I think if any of us have to take solace in anything, it's that we are all going through this. I am, um, you know, whenever tragedy strikes, sometimes you feel like you're alone. Um, you know, as hard as everything has been to deal with, um, at least we we all have our each other. You know, this is not something that's just happened to our you know district or even our state. I mean, this is happening all over the country and all over the world. Um, and and so we're able to lean on each other a little bit um, and being creative. I know I as a parent have had to get very creative very fast. Um, and I've just been so incredibly grateful to everybody who's been so willing um, and, and ready to share their ideas and their best practices. So I really want to just thank everybody for coming out tonight, especially my special guests, Representative Matt Colazar, Denise Dunn, and Denise Forrest, the Denises. Um, and I'm going to continue to do this on Tuesdays. We're just going to get together and we're going to talk about uh, the topics at hand. Next Tuesday, we're going to talk about our senior population, uh, seniors and our elder seniors, not our high school seniors, um, and some of the challenges that are, are happening right now with uh, loved ones who have parents, grandparents who are in um, senior facilities or, or retirement areas 
and they're not able to visit um, because of, of the concerns. So we're gonna talk about that next Tuesday, but um, I just really want to give a very heartfelt thank you to everyone, including my special guests for coming out tonight and talking about this and uh, keep calm and carry on. Bye everyone. <laughs>